I work for the Kendall Corporation. We are currently, I think, the 17th largest provider in the nation of this type of living, which is uh, not-for-profit life plan communities. We are celebrating our 50th year of operation this year, first campus. Anne happens to know the original one because she was in Philadelphia in those days, in the early 70s. We are a Philadelphia-based Quaker organization. The two original campuses opened in 1973. And then we have grown systematically throughout the years up to, what do you know, 200 miles away in Healdsburg and So Village. So Kendall has grown that way. We've developed our own campuses or we've allowed organizations who have a similar mindset of the way the organization will operate to join us. And so we've actually got a couple of our campuses. If you go to our website, you'll see a couple on there that we didn't develop, but they, they wanted to join the system they've been allowed to. The difference between us and a lot of large systems in this business is this. We use what's called a federal model of, of organizational structure. I mean, we, our Quaker roots say we don't vote, we try to reach consensus, we, we work together to make decisions. So it, what makes us very different is normally if you look, and I can, there's a ton of big uh, multi-facility campuses around where the corporate office says, you will do this, you will buy this service, you will offer your residents this menu. You know, they really, it's hierarchical. Kendall doesn't operate that way. My, my standard line, I said it earlier, is if you've seen one Kendall, you've seen one Kendall. Because really, the control of the campuses stays local. So I think that's another one of those things that should be appealing to the folks of Humboldt County, is that the board of, local board of directors, a lot of local professional staff will make the decisions on, on what the program is now. We have a lot of resources corporately that we provide, but, that, but you don't have to accept them all. I mean, you, you know, I could advise some of our campuses to do a renovation or an expansion, and they, may, they don't have to listen to me. I'm a resource, so that's really how we operate. But you know, we have what you'd expect. We have HR, we have in, in, uh, IT, we have a finance office. So we, can, we provide a lot of those services to our affiliates, but how they use our services varies based on each, each campus. So I already gave you a little bit of that, 40, you know, 40 years in this business, uh, you know, I'm still passionate about it. I remember when I was working for um, Leading Age New York in the early 80s, I heard about this CCRC, Continuing Care Retirement Community Model, and I was like, wow, what a great idea. You move into the campus when you're younger and healthier, you live in a great communal setting, have all kinds of activities and fitness and dining. And then, should you have some frailty or some issue, you have the higher level of care visible, you know, uh, available on the campus. So I always thought that it was a great model. And then you know, later in my career, I made the switch over. So the, the question, I mean, I know I don't, I don't need to ask this question to most of this audience because I can see how, how many people are involved already or supportive, but what appealed to Ben Butler, my colleague and I, when we met Ann and Pat in Denver was, you know, that first bullet, local project with local citizens, trying to do something for the local citizens. And I have often done development work on Blue Sky, that's, that's what we call these new campuses, Blue Sky projects, where I'll get opposition sometimes because they'll think I'm gonna build something that draws people into your community. It's not for you, it's for people from farther away. It's a we them thing. And, and I love having, telling people this statistic because I have said it many times in local planning board meetings. 75% of the people who live in the campus currently live within 10 to 15 miles of the campus. Now, that varies a little bit. This county's a little bigger in one direction or another. You, you, you get the little, little puddle of water behind us, the Pacific Ocean that stops. But really, most of the people who will move there, and then another 10 to 15 percent have family locally. And they'll, they'll move back, or maybe they lived here at one point, and they'll move back. So 90 percent of the people in the future who live at Life Plan Humboldt have some connection to the local area. So when I say it's a local project, it very much is a local project. I mean, Ann and, and the board and the team here have done an amazing job because 
when, you move, when there is no other life plan community nearby, Enso Village, our, our newest project, 200 miles away, is the closest one. There's an education process. And normally, if we said, oh, we'll come up to Humboldt, you know, to, to McKinleyville and help build this community, we, Candle Corporation, and, and our partner, Greenbrier, would have to educate the market about the whole concept. I mean, that's a little bit of what I'm doing today. But you're, you know, the leaders here in the room have done that tremendously well. You have such interest in this idea that it, it gives a, a real advantage for moving this along. You know, that first bullet, as I just said, you move in independent, and you have the security of knowing that if you need care, no one wants to have higher levels of care, but if you need it, it's there. That second bullet, though, is one that most people don't understand. I would call a life plan community a bricks and mortar insurance policy that protects your assets. For many people, they, their, life, their biggest asset, their life savings, is in their house. So what we're, what we're saying is, sell your house and then give us that money and choose an apartment, a bigger one if you have more, you know, a bigger house and more assets coming or a smaller one. It, it's completely the choice of the person. And there's a refundability associated with the, the decision. So what that means, in this case, it's currently we're planning an 80% refund. So uh, I'll just use a round number. I'm just picking it out of the air. Say you, you sell your house, you give me $300,000, and you move into a nice two-bedroom apartment. You can live in the apartment for as long as you're able. You don't own the apartment, and that's really it's another bullet that's coming up. Is it's not a real estate play. You're not an owner. You sign a contract for care and services that say you're allowed to live in the apartment as long as you do it so that you're not a risk to yourself or to others. So if you end up frail, that's the hard part of managing these communities. You help people move and transition to higher levels of care. But, but then, and then when, when you pass, and 98% of the people, I, I have to tell you the statistic, I, I don't I always like to tell people this, but it's the truth, 98% of the people who move into life plan communities, it's their final home, and they're gonna pay, you know, they'll pass away. The 80% refund goes back to their estate in most cases. So for those of you with kids or grandkids, it's an, an ability to take that asset, your home, and pass, the, pass it on to your next generation. In the meantime, though, you're going to live, on average, 11 years. That's the t statistic. 11 years is the average time that people live in life plan communities. So you can have a wonderful retirement with all kinds of amenities and services and then give 80% of your original asset back to your heirs. And that's it's very much, and, and you know what? One, one way that you know it's almost like an insurance product is in, in a lot of states, it's the insurance department that regulates these communities. It's the aging department in a lot of states like California and you know, a lot of states that Kendall operates in, but sometimes the insurance department's involved because they'll run actuarial projections on how much you're charging, how much money you put in reserve, because you're, what you're gonna say to the people who move in, should you need care, uh, it's gonna be there and available to you. And so, you know, I've got to, you know, put money aside, a reserve fund aside, so that we have the, care, the, the ability to do that. The bottom bullets, life plan. There, were, there's a, there was a lot of articles that said, oh, this, is, this care model, it's going gonna, it's gonna to not survive the pandemic. You know, it's, it's, people are going to be fearful. I mean, obviously, we all saw in the news if you were in a nursing home, that was a terrible place to be with the pandemic. COVID got in and it was lethal to the people who live in nursing homes. But I want to tell you, for the first time in Kendall's history, our 12 communities have 95% occupancy. Because, and I always trust the, the, the prudence and wiseness of seniors because they figured out the best place to be in a pandemic is in a communal setting where you had people you know, do your grocery shopping for you. They delivered meal, meals to your apartment door. You weren't eating together, admittedly, at the worst parts of the pandemic, but you were in a still communal setting and you, and you were getting services. So really, the, you know, this model proved itself even more so. And around the country, that's really still very much the case. 
How many of them are there? There's 1,900 life plan communities. At least that's uh, Ziegler uh, Capital Markets. They're the largest investment banking firm that has helped support these communities. They keep the statistics. I, you know, as I mentioned, 50 years, that's really the earliest ones were Quaker communities that were developed around Philadelphia, including Kendall. I live in, in the Jersey suburbs of Philly, and there's one in my town called Medford Lees. They opened in 74. So that's, you know, the roots, the Quakers really were the ones who, who, who helped you know, evolve this model of care. It worked, and, it, and I think it's a reflection of the professionalism that we now see. There was a time in the 70s, it was actually in, in your fine state, um, there was a Methodist organization that had, they had built too many of them too quickly, and they, they, the money situation was kind of sketchy, and it really caused the whole industry to take a step back and say, we got to be more professional in how we do this. And now, I mean, I, I used to be able to say, I've never seen a life plan community go bankrupt. You know, I got news though, the 2008 recession was so deep that there were some communities that went bankrupt because they were opening at the wrong time, seniors couldn't sell their houses, they had spent a lot of money building the place. But I gotta tell you, no seniors, and this is still true, nobody who was gonna move into one lost any money. You know who lost? The investment bankers who invested in the communities, they took serious haircuts. And, and a lot of those communities restructured and came out of bankruptcy. So once again, that asset protection bullet before really still holds. I, I, I strongly believe that the structure and the professionalism of senior living has gotten uh, much, much stronger. Okay, so I started on this one already, the entrance fee. It's not really a real estate deal. It's the refundability of it is, is really the unique aspect. And I would mention that there in the entrance fee model, there is a, what we call a traditional option or what's called an advertised spend down model. And what that means is that $300,000 apartment I was talking about earlier, you can have the same apartment for, I'm going to make up the number, but I'm going to be close, 220, you know, 80,000 less. But what happens is over, over time, the refund amortizes down to zero. So 2% a month goes away. And so say you, you know, again, I'm just making numbers up here. You, you, have, you sold your house for a million dollars and you're a very wise investor. You say, well, why should I give the organization, you know, the 80% refundable option? I can choose the spend down, it's cost less. I get the same exact services and I can invest the difference. And honestly, some people do that. And so th there's options. That's really all I'm trying to say here. There's options on how you approach it. And there's lower cost options. So if you, again, if your house isn't as worth as much as your neighbor, you still have an option. You still can get into the community and choose that. This is the key point. You know, Ann was asking me to mention Healdberg. I'll tell you, the up highest entrance fee at Enso Village is $2 million. Okay, because 75% of the people who are going to live in Healdsburg live in the Bay Area. And, you know, real estate in the Bay Area, I know it's getting a little softer at the moment, but it's still pretty crazy what houses sell for there. So the land cost $15 million. And, and development there was just very expensive. And so, but that, that does not mean that that's the case here in Humboldt County. What we try to do is develop a project and we've been running a financial model, starting to get, gather information so that the vast majority of seniors who are homeowners could sell their home and afford this, this model. So I don't have prices. I know, that's, that, I know that's gonna be a question that comes up. I don't have prices for you right now, but I do promise once we get the model tightened, we will give you, give you prices. But it is gonna reflect the local real estate values. And, we don't start construction. I mean, Ann said it earlier, you know, 27 is, you know, 2027 is a likely target for opening. And that's after two years of construction. So you say, well, wait a minute, it's only 2023. What, there's two years in between. We have to pre-sell. This is the way these communities operate. We have to pre-sell the units with 10% deposits 
up to the 70% level. So say right now we're talking, say, 150. That's about 105 that needs to be sold before we start construction. So there's marketing. Then, you know, Ann said we're going to hire a professional marketing staff and open a marketing office because there is a process. This is, and this is the, what the state of California would require. It's to your benefit. It protects you. But when we are able, you know, as Ann said, maybe in February, um, we get the approval from California, we, we will start to take deposits. Now, there will be $1,000 deposits first, and this is the key. It's an escrow account in your own name, earning interest. I, I'm in Jersey. It probably makes you nervous. I, 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 I can't reach into your account. The accounts are in your name. And then, say in a year and a half, a year, maybe a year, I'm going to ask you to give me 10% of that entrance fee, that future entrance fee, and that's, that's, that's sizable dollar, more sizable dollars. Same escrow account, still controlled by you. It gives you the opportunity, something happens, your children move to Florida, I don't know, to Texas, you decide you're going to leave. You, if the escrow is yours, you can take it and go. So how safe are the monies? There, there is what I was just talking about. But the, the, uh, the second part of it is really this. What makes these communities safe for you are really that, those four levels of financial security. The board, so you have several board members in the room. You know, the board, local board is going to have fiduciary responsibility to make sure the community is managed, developed, operated appropriately. It's a big responsibility, but that stays local. So that's your local citizens. You're going to have a development team. Kendall's involved. Greenbrier is a professional development company. We're in the process of doing an RFP for architects. We would choose only a firm who is experienced in doing these types of projects. We would use local planners and local engineers, local attorneys. We would, you know, we don't, we do projects all over the country, but we do know that when you go into a local, you know, in this case a county, you, you want to make sure you've got people who know how to do things locally. So that's going to happen. So you have a, an experienced development team. That's a financial protection because it means the projects, the financial models been, been vetted many times before. And what, what I always say is we build a conservative financial model. It's like this. Then we tighten it as we get to construction. So right now we're carrying very high interest rates in the model. That's why I don't want to give you uh, entrance fees because they're, they, they're too high right now because the, the interest rates are too high. But as we get further along, we'll start to tighten that to reflect what the market is. The goal is to get the model so tight that right at the start of construction, it really matches. The, you know, we're going to hire a contractor. We're going to uh, make them sign what's called a guaranteed maximum price contract, which really means here's what we're building. Here's the construction drawings. You had to guarantee me you're going to build it exactly as it's been designed. And that's part of you know, the, the, this two-year process. I, I mentioned the California, right, California regulatory system. You are not by far the worst in the country, you know, the, the hardest. I know California has st tough regulations. Not, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a consumer protection approach. New York is just way more of a headache than <laughs> California is. Maryland's no, no, no walk in the park either. So there are other states that have tougher laws. But California has a pretty robust regulatory protection. And that's, again, that's to your benefit. And then the last one I always love to tell people, and they're like, what? Bondholders, you know, the people who bought the debt? Yeah, they're, they have a real interest in the community being successful because they want their money back with interest. So what that means, and, you know, this Life Plan Humboldt is a not-for-profit, okay? I, I, I should have put that on my earlier st slide for statistics. 90 plus percent of those 1900 communities nationwide are nonprofit. And there's a reason, because you're not going to give your life savings to some for profit developer because they run away, they disappear, they go bankrupt. It doesn't happen in the nonprofit world. So the bondholders like the fact that there's an experienced team, they like the fact that there's a local leadership. They'll loan us, it's probably $100 million to build this. It's probably north of 100 million. And then they're going to require Ann, as the board chair, every quarter to go on a Zoom and say, okay, 
we're at this level, we're staffed, and then we have to provide written financial documents on a, on a quarterly basis. So that if the community starts to have a problem, the bond buyers have the right to impose uh, outside management. You know, there's, there's remedies. And that, again, is a protection for the future residents of the community because it means, you know, it's not the fox watching the hen house. It's really, they have an interest. Your interests, their interests are aligned with yours. So I, I always say to people, those people who loan us the money, they are really, they're very professional. They're mutual funds. They're ones you've heard of, Vanguard, you know, Pioneer. They buy these bonds, not in large amounts, but that's a small part of their portfolio. When we get to a point when we're about getting closer to finance, they will, they will come up here and they will want to kick the tires. They will want to see the land. They will, they will want to see everything. And they ask some of the toughest questions, like, you know, have you thought about this? Where did, what about that? What am I worried? You know, it's California, so they're going to ask about earthquakes. They're going to ask about fires. You know, so those are the things that we have answers for. But they, they will look at the files. And when I say I've pre-sold the community, they're going to look at the actual file. They're going to look at your name and say, okay, this person is, at, is real, and there's actually 70% of the units sold. So that's the kind of stuff that happens as we move through the process. We already talked about the schedule. Two more years, I mean, they take time. Some of it's local approvals, it's in this case, county approvals. And then you have the state of California and then marketing to get to that, that magical 70% number. Rest assured, my goal as the per, I'm a development consultant, and this is what I've been done in the last 24 four years. My goal is to go as fast as I can do it while not being, you know, embracing risk. So that's always a balance because well, let's see, it's 2023. What's the real estate market going to look like in 2027? What's the, what are the interest rates? Uh, you know, I mean, you don't know. That's the risk with these projects. And that's why I have a conservative financial model. Because as I get closer to the date where I'm going to start construction, I'm going to reflect actual market conditions. But right now, rest assured, uh, Cole Gray, is, he works for Greenbrier. He's their financial guy. They run a very conservative financial model that, you know, they, they have been our partner at Enso Village and they've done other California projects too. So that's why I think they're, they're a good partner for us on this because they know how to operate here in California. Oh, I'm being cut off. Thank you. <laughs> We've, we're setting aside part of the land, you know, in McKinleyville, and we're contracting with a local developer of low-income housing for seniors. And so there will be the 60 is the number we're 30 to 60. We, you know, we're not sure what the number will be, but that project will be on the ground, same ground, and you know, we'll again to be worked out. We would work out. Uh, um, you know, an arrangement where may the residents of that community may be, be able to access some of the services from Life Plan Humboldt. Um, I happened to, in my past, when I was a consultant, worked with a Quaker organization in Maryland, in Sandy Spring, Maryland, and they had the same thing. They built a low-income housing tax credit project for seniors on the grounds of their, of their Life Plan community. And they share the gardens, they, the walking paths, they, you know, it's, it's a very symbiotic relationship and it's not this we them relationship, it's worked out. So, so that, that, but to qualify for that one, low income housing tax credit, you, they're gonna see what your, your income is based upon a local measure. So if, if you couldn't afford Life Plan Humboldt, there's a possibility you could afford the, the low income credit. And it, it might, we do our best not to have people fall in between, but you're, you are correct. Um, it's, it's, it's the hard part of trying to do these projects because the cost of construction today is so high, the cost of land, but we try to spread the market, and that's what I call it, spreading the market as much as we're able. The one bedroom apartment with an amortized bend down will be much less than a two bedroom with den, you know, with the 80% refund. You know, how many people come to the marketing office and are interested and they can't afford it? And 
it's you know it's not a happy thing to tell someone that but i think that's that's the reality of it because the community the only source of revenue for this community are the people who live in it you know who pay the fees i mean that's honestly the truth so when we open and you then pay the rest of your entrance fee it's not still all going to go for construction because but the state of California is going to require us to fund certain reserve funds, operating reserves, debt service coverage ratios, and they use all kinds of financial statistics. And so we're going to have pots of money held aside because there's an 80% refund. So, you know, I've never seen a community open and everybody move out, you know, but, you know, we have to have money to give those refunds. And, you know, that, that is, uh, you know, one of the reasons why only a portion of the, of the entrance fees are used to actually fund the construction. So that's going to be the 80% refundable option for, so you or your estate would get 80% of that original entrance fee back. If you wanted not to pay that high amount, it's about 25% or 20%, some someplace in that range, less expensive for the exact same unit. So that, that, you know, I use the example of the three hundred thousand dollar unit. It, maybe it's two thirty or two whatever, two twenty five. Same unit that amortizes down to no refundability over a period of fifty months, two percent a month. So that's that's a less expensive way to get into the community, but there's no refundability with it. So that's, that's just an option. Again, I, I, never, I never tell people what to choose because some people have the, the different financial circumstances. Your question earlier about the, if you have a long-term care insurance policy, that factors into some of that as well. But I do know people who have chosen the amortized spend down option, the traditional is what we call it, because they are investors, you know, and they think that they can put money into something, real estate or the stock market, I don't know what, but and make more money than. Uh, you'll hear from me or Ben Butler in the future more, I promise. Thank you. <laughs>
deducting the thousand from her future refund on her entrance fee. And, and trust me, my siblings and I, we told her to do it. We said the community lets you do it. It's in a sense almost a, an in-between from the amortized spend down option because she didn't choose that. So that's, you know, we will run, uh, there's a, it's a computer uh, program that runs the, they put your assets and your income and all that in and they will tell you. So that, that's my answer for now. I don't have a number for you. Okay, yeah. The question is, what if you have a long-term care insurance policy? How does that play you know, with this lifestyle? It's a great question. We had a period of time where I used, to, I used to start by saying, how many people in the room have long-term care insurance? And I would ask for a show of hands. And everybody in the room would raise their hands. But then the insurance company started to say, oh, these policies are, are dreadful for us because people are actually spending them. And so they made it more expensive. They made it harder to do. There are still some people out there, maybe through work, who have them. The answer is, um, we've had people say, OK, I told you the good example, I'll use the example again with the 4,000 a month. You're living in an apartment, a two bedroom, you're paying me 4,000 a month. You need assisted living permanently. You know, you've had a fall, you're confused, whatever the issue is. Your 4,000 to pay for the health care can come from your long-term care insurance policy. So in some cases it makes sense to keep the policy, but I'm not gonna tell you to do that because some people say, they're charging me X amount a month. I'm giving it up because I'm buying a policy, a policy by moving into a life plan community. So the, answer, the real answer is you should weigh it and look at it. I mean, I, always would, I would always, I mean, I kiddingly say this and then people, they laugh or they look at me with two, you know, cross eyes and they say, it's not really funny. I say, should you keep your policy? Well, I would say, well, do you plan to live a long time? You know, I don't, you know what I mean? It's a hard, it's a hard question because the cost of those policies go up and up. I mean, I had one when I worked for Leading Age National. I was young then, and, and I, as soon as I left them, I, I threw that aside. I wasn't going to pay for a long-term care insurance policy. I look back on it now, and I think those are the when the policies were cheaper when you were younger. And a lot of people give them up before they, you know, they get up there in years. So, But they, they can work with this model. What happens is, it's called uh, future health. You're, you are paying in your entrance fee when you move in. This is where the big tax advantage comes in. You give me an entrance fee and you move into your, to your two bedroom apartment. We will calculate, we, the community, and give you that tax year an estimate of how much of, your, of that entrance fee is a payment for future care. And the IRS accepts it and you can deduct it from your taxes that year. And then on an annual basis, monthly fees are way s smaller. So the, the, we'll tell you that on, a, on an annual basis too, and those are all tax deductions you can take. The assisted living model in California and in other states allows for a lot more care than in the past. Whereas you might need skilled nursing, you, you can get similar care at the assisted living level. Because what turns out is, and again, I don't want to dwell on the fact, but some people will end up with levels of uh, Alzheimer's or dementia. So we're going to build, we're planning for a, a unit of memory support. And in the old days, we built those like skilled nursing units. They were licenses skilled, which was the wrong decision. We were building them wrong in those days because more, more often than not, when someone has you know, senile dementia or Alzheimer's, physically they're not, I mean, they can be, but most, again, I'm speaking in generalities, that people are generally physically okay, but they're showing confusion. So building those units at the assisted living level makes more sense. And so that's what's happening. We're not building any new skilled nursing in this country right now. And the number of skilled beds at a time when the number of seniors is, is rocketing higher, the number of skilled beds is shrinking. 
And that's because the seniors don't want to live in skilled nursing. The pandemic reinforced they were, you know, it was a bad place to be if you were, if you were really frail because once, the, once COVID got in. So the new assisted living models that we build are residential. And I really mean that. Their households is, is the term for them, where uh, the, the people who live in the unit share a living room and a kitchen and a dining area. And they live in single rooms, no double rooms, and they share that in a household. And so the plan is, you know, again, it's early. We haven't, we haven't designed anything here yet, but this is the, the trend you find in the industry is that uh, that's, that's the type of care people want. cultural, educational, social, music. There'll be so much going on at the community because guess, guess, it's not Kendall or, or, you know, we're supporting the community or it's not even the board. You know who's going to decide what, what the amenities are? People who live there. Our communities end up with, on average, 40 to 50 committees. I, I really mean that. 40 to 50 committees and, you know, uh, quilting, trains, uh, I mean, I, they're, 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 they're stuff all over the board. And there's groups of residents, and they come together, and they decide what programs are, are you know, we have uh, activity staff and concierge, people who support trips to Broadway, or, you know, it depends on where you are, but music, our Collington community used them as an example. They, cut, they developed a relationship with the University of Maryland, it's a couple miles up the road. They have two music majors who live at the campus for six months, and they play every night at dinner, and they, they have, they have a, a, you know, 250 or 300 grandparents because everybody loves them. They're delightful young people. Kendall, we don't do anything unless it's developed with a, a, an eye towards sustainability and environmentally friendly approaches to design, construction, and operation. It's... You go to our website, there's a whole section on, it's one of our, the Quaker philosophies, stewardship of the earth. So we believe in it and, you know, it, I know it re will resonate. We would never, nobody's doing new communities without embracing it. And LEED certification, you'll hear that. That's, I mean, everybody's so far beyond that at the retirement community level because a lot of the you know, municipalities and counties have, been, have brought that into their regulations. But we were going to make sure that it, it, it's a big part of the community here. <laughs> environmental impact report has been done on the property prior and um it, and the county is going to be doing an environmental impact report of the whole town center yeah. so it remains to be seen whether we actually have to do another one another um, one yeah right at the moment we believe we're principally permitted in other words we go right to the uh we have to do various studies like we've looked at the trees and the wildlife and the rare plants and and all of that but, um, and if, if, you know, vehicle miles travel, the traffic impact, but that we'll be able to go direct to the building department rather than through that whole planning process. It's one of the attractions yeah. of that property. And we're gonna, believe me, we're gonna do a good job at it. We're not gonna do a shoddy process. And we're, as Frank said, we're looking to make it sustainable, you know, environmentally sustainable, net zero or whatever. It's wait lists. So when we get the approval from this, uh, this is, all right, here's my, here's my only marketing sales pitch of the day. Uh, when we get the approval, the first person who gives us $1,000 de deposit, and not on the spot, but soon thereafter, gets to choose an apartment. And then 10%, and then if we're open and we're full, we, we start and grow and maintain a, a wait list. We will, if you, you become a depositor, well, we're going we're gonna to suppose that you give us the 10% and we are going through the sales process, the marketing process, and we get into construction. We are going to have regular meetings and keep you up to date. And we are going to tell you when we are going to open. So we, we've been going through it down the road in Healdsburg because we've been saying to the resident, the future residents there, 
yeah, we're on schedule. I mean, that's the thing that can happen. Construction, they had a ton of, I mean, you guys probably had it too, a ton of rain. That made the construction schedule very challenging down there. But the builders done an amazing job. And then we hired this outside consultant, Moving Stations, and they screened a bunch of local realtors, a bunch of moving companies, and other support. And we've, they, we, they provided that information to the future residents and saying, okay, here's your time schedule. Now, we are aware, like you could have your house on the market and someone could say, oh, I'm buying your house, okay, you accept the bid, then they cancel on you. So that happens. So we're always working to schedule people. If the community opened, everybody can't move in on day one anyway. So we're gonna let you, as long as you're intending to move in, we're gonna work with the individual future resident to do that. So the moving stations has you know, people who help with downsizing and there are, they're out there. They, they will give you a list of realtors, they'll give you the list of moving companies, they will help you, they'll give you the information on how to sell stuff online, how to have yard sales. You, they'll work with you to make it happen, yeah. Oh, they'll put you in touch with somebody who will do it for you. Yeah, they're, up, they're out there. People are out there to help you downsize. If you don't have that uh, down payment, then you, you would have to probably sell your house and move into a little apartment. And, That's, you know, you know what? Between. It's a great comment because that, some people decide to do that. The first people moved into Enso, a lot of them sold their houses already um, because they were like, and that forced them to downsize and do, it's exactly right. It, it, it's, it's definitely a possibility. It's an option that some people choose. I will, I will say that. And if the market's, I mean, again, we got two years, maybe the interest rates come back down, the market gets hot again, it may be the time to sell. I, I'm, we're not gonna advise you on when's the time to sell other than when we're gonna open and then we're gonna give you some time, a gap, you know, to, to, to move. But some people absolutely do that. That's a great, you know, great insight because that's exactly well, how some people think. It makes sense to think, you know, on Tuesday you sell your house and Thursday you move. Probably not. Oh, um, no, you mean you close where you have to be out. Yeah, that's exact. We'll work with you to coordinate that. We'll get the moving company to come and get your stuff and they'll drive straight to the new community and move you right into your apartment. That's what happens. That's what's happening on October 31st in Healdsburg. There's a bunch of moving vans that are gonna be on that ground moving people into their first new apartments. Every day till Valentine's Day, till 80% are moved in, there's gonna be several, I mean, it's tightly controlled and scheduled because that is a very tight site for the size community they're building. There's not a lot of room to put those moving, you know, think of a big moving truck. I mean, so we have to schedule it. So we will, we would work to make that happen.